So today we're talking about solids of revolution. Okay, up to this point we've been talking about the area between curves, any curves, so on and so forth. Now we're going to be talking about the volume of particular solids that are formed by rotating 360 degrees around the x-axis and the y-axis. And we're also going to be talking about improper integrals. So you guys are going to be able to, to compute improper integrals as well. So first off, let's consider a curve, y equals f of x. If the shaded area is revolved around the x-axis through 360 degrees of a rotation along the x-axis, a 3D solid will be formed, and this solid is called your solid of revolution. Now, to go about calculating the volume of this particular solid, you have you can think of it as it being made up of, of very thin cylindrical disk, right? Like if we were, if we actually had like a physical uh, a physical shape of what was created through that revolution that you guys saw the animation of, and we were to cut it into very, very, very small disc, right, to like slice through it, they basically would be cylinders, okay, where the radius of each of those, each of those discs would be the value of the function. So to find the volume of revolution, pulled straight from your reference booklet, It'll be V equals the integral from A to B of pi times Y squared DX, where Y represents your function. So essentially what you have is that if you were to slice this, you are creating a disc, a very, very, very thin disc, right? That's created from your curve that's being rotated around your X axis. And here's your X axis, okay? So you're essentially finding the volume of this very, very, very thin cylinder, which old school volume forming for a cylinder is pi r squared. It's just that now your radius is your actual function because from the x-axis, which is the center of your cylinder, to an edge on the cylinder is the y distance of your actual function, like the y value of that respective function. And yes, there's like infinitely many discs that can be formed between your function being rotated around from one x value to another x value. So by using this formula that again, I pulled straight from the reference booklet, you are essentially finding the volume of the cylinder from some starting point to some ending point. Let's take a look at an example. So we're going to find the volume of the solid formed when the graph of the function y equals x squared for zero, um, x is greater than zero, um, but less than five is revolved through two pi about the x axis. First off, two pi is the same thing as? So it's basically saying it's, it's a normal revolution creating that cylindrical solid. So you're going to use again the formula for volume, which is from A to B of pi y squared. Close to dy, no dx. I think that's what it was. Okay, remember pi is nothing but a constant, so you really could just pull that out. And this becomes pi, the integral from zero to five of your function, because remember y represents your function. So that's going to be x squared. You're going to square it dx. x squared is not x squared squared is nothing but x to the and how do you take the antiderivative of x to the fourth? It's one over five. X to the fifth. I'm going to evaluate that from zero to five. There's still a pi on the outside that needs to be multiplied once I actually do evaluate the antiderivative. What's five to the fifth power? 25, 725. 625. 625. Or better yet, since you know it's five to the fifth and you're divide, you're multiplying by one fifth, so you're technically dividing by five. five four. It's technically five to the fourth, so it's five to the fourth. 625. So this becomes pi times 625 minus, I got to blow my lower bound, that's zero, 
So my answer is just going to be 625 pi units cubed. That's it. Well, I'm looking at this number here. There's six four in there. Don't look at the computer. Mm -hmm. It's skinny. All righty. Hold on. Remember, y represents your function. Y represents your function. So you replace y with your function. You got a square, so that's where we got x to the fourth. And then we do the antiderivative of, <laughs> excuse me, uh, using fundamental of theorem of calculus to actually evaluate the integral to get the volume. This is for the x axis. Now, if the function is invertible, okay, it has an inverse, just like how we did when we found the area between the curve and the y-axis, we can do the same thing for volume, okay? The difference, it, like to be honest, it's the exact same function, it's just the difference is you want to make sure that your function, you plug in the inverse, okay? So just like how we did when we were doing the area between the curve and the y-axis, we're going to take the function, solve for x, and then that gets plugged in here. So x represents the function, just like how y represents the function when we were rotating around the x-axis. So let's look at this example. I have the graph of y equals ln of x, where x is between 1 and e, inclusive. This time it's revolved through 2 pi about the y-axis. This time we're the y-axis. We're going to find the volume of revolution. So again, similar to when you were finding the area between the curve and the y-axis, you want to make sure your function is in terms of y instead of x. Right now, it's in terms of x. I need to get it in terms of y. So I essentially need to solve for x. Say what? Exactly. I raise both sides to the e or put e on both sides. Remember, e to the ln cancel out. So e to the y is equal to x. There's my function. There's just one other thing I also need to change. Okay? My bounds are with respect to x. My bounds need to be with respect to y. So what do I do? You just plug them in. What's the ln of 1? Zero. What's the ln of e? One. So my bounds, my lower bound is zero, my upper bound is one. So to find my volume for this invertible function, as it's rotating around the y-axis, it's gonna be from zero to one pi times my function. This time it's with respect to y. So it's gonna be e to the y squared dy. A power to a power, what do I do? Multiply. I'm going to also pull out the pi. So this becomes e to the 2y dy. How do I take the antiderivative of e to the 2y? One half e to the 2y. I'm going to evaluate that from 0 to 1. Don't forget, there's still a pi on the outside. One thing that I still have difficulty with is always forget about the pi when I'm doing volume. So don't forget about your pi. Make a note. Don't forget about your pi. Don't forget. I'm going to plug in my top bound first. So that's going to be 1 half e to the second minus plugging in my lower bound. 1 half e to the 0 power. I know that anything to the 0 power is 1. So this is essentially just going to be I mean, I mean, I don't know how you guys will write it, but I'll write it as pi over 2, e to the second minus pi over 2. Like, I'll distribute that pi over. Remember, e to the 0 is 1. Questions on finding the volume of revolution. So if there are two functions, an upper and a lower function, similar to when we're doing area between two curves, and that is rotated around the x-axis, then we create a washer because there's the space that's existing between 
that inside curve and the x-axis, okay? So now there's essentially a hole there, okay? And it creates a washer. To find the volume of that washer, or in other words, to find the volume that's uh, of the figure that's created when you rot uh, rotate two curves around the x-axis is what you see here. Unfortunately, this is not in your reference booklet, okay? So you are gonna have to know this. It is pi times the integral from A to B of your top function squared minus your bottom function squared, dx. Similar to finding the area between two curves, it's the top minus the bottom. For volume, you square both of them and you put a pi on the outside. All right, here's an example. We're gonna find the volume of revolution generated by revolving the region between y equals x squared and y equals the square root of x about the x-axis. As we know, y equals x squared looks like a what? That has a vertex at zero, zero, and then one, one, and then two, four, so on and so forth. What does um, square root of x look like? And it starts at zero, zero. Its next point is at one, one, and then this next one's not until four, two, correct? So here is the, the part that they're gonna be rotating around the x-axis. And so to find the volume, it's gonna be pi times the integral from what to what? What's the start of it? And the end? One. So it needs to be your top curve squared minus your bottom curve squared. Which one's on top? So it's gonna be square root of x squared minus your bottom curve, x squared, squared, dx. All right, I want you guys to work this one out. Leave your answer in terms of pi. This is what this simplifies down to be, the antiderivative. That has to be evaluated from zero to one. Again, don't forget this little pi on the outside because we are talking about volume. Upper bound minus lower bound, and you get three pi over 10 units cubed. Wait, hmm. Now I talk about improper integrals. <laughs> it actually incorporates a old concept. An improper integral, or integral is improper if one of the following is true. The functions being integrated, the function being integrated approaches zero, um, infinity or negative infinity for one or more points on the domain or if the integral is of one of these forms that you see listed below. That's like a trademark and of yours. In this course, that's, that means something. In this course, we consider only the improper integrals that are in the form of the integral from A to infinity of F of X. So out of all those three, you don't really have to worry about the one that's from A to infinity. How we define that is what you see here. It is the limit as B approaches infinity from A to B of your function. Yes, limits. And you have to think with limits comes all of the old concepts that dealt with limits, such as L'Hopital's rule, okay? Not so much first principle, but like probably more like L'Hopital's rule, um, you know, the whole idea that, you know, a limit is approaching a, um, is com converging to a particular number, those concepts. So the integral from A to infinity of a function. So for those types of integrals, the limit as B approaches infinity of the integral from A to B of F of X is how we we'll go about evaluating that particular integral. Um, of course, provided that the limit exists. So we still got to deal with that notion. There is a possibility that the limit is not going to exist. For an improper integral to exist, then your function must approach zero as x is approaching infinity. 
So essentially it has to kind of curve down, flatten out at the x-axis in order for our, um, in order for our uh, integral to exist. That's first. first example. We're going to evaluate the integral from 1 to infinity of 1 over x to the third dx. So following the formula, that is going to be the limit as b approaches infinity of your from a to b. Well, if you take a look, a is actually one, b stays as it is, it stays as b, okay? Of one over x to the third dx, okay? So what do we do? We integrate, okay? In order to integrate one over x to the third, we have to rewrite x to the third as x to the negative third. So when I integrate that, what do we get? Is it negative one half? Negative one half x squared. The x squared is in the denominator, correct? Yeah. Yes. All right, then we're going to evaluate that from one to b. Okay. So, mind you, this limit as b approaches infinity gets traveled down all the way until it's actually time for us to evaluate the limit as b approaches infinity. So, I plug in my upper bound, I subtract it from when I plug in my lower bound. Two negatives make a positive, so this turns into a plus one half. And now I can actually evaluate the limit as b approaches infinity. Well, if b approaches infinity, that means it's going to be a really, really large number, not, no, not to mention on top of that it's being squared. So I bet that negative one over a super huge number. What number is that essentially Zero. getting closer and closer to? Not infinity, zero, because it's one over infinity, so zero. So essentially, this entire piece goes away, and I'm just left with one. And that's the value of the integral from one to infinity of one over x to the third dx. One half. Look it's like one more time when our cross is out. Because as you evaluate the limit as b approaches infinity, so in other words, as b gets really, really large, right? A really large number. Let's just say 10,000. This essentially becomes one over two times 10,000 squared. That is a small number over a really, really, really big number. And the bigger that that B value gets, the closer this entire fraction is getting to zero. Mm -hmm. So essentially it's gonna converge to zero and not exist at all. Remember that was the whole concept of a limit. Like it's getting closer and closer to one number. Sometimes it converged to zero, sometimes it converged to an another number, sometimes it went to infinity. In this case, it's going to zero. So the only thing we're left with is that positive one half from when we've evaluated it at one. So that's the easy one. It's the involved one. This one incorporates not just the proper integrals, but incorporates two other concepts. So we're going to evaluate the integral uh, from a to infinity of x e to the negative d negative x dx for any constant of A. A is any real number. What makes this on the hard level is the fact that A could be any number. It's not like the last problem where A was one and then we were able actually, you know, to work it out that way. In this particular case, we're going to get an expression for our integral versus a value. Alrighty. So let's do this. The likelihood I can keep it in this one little space, probably not likely at all, but let's give it a whirl. So here we go. The limit as b approaches infinity of the integral from a to b. Well, a is a to b of this function. Now, just like before, we're going to do the antiderivative of it, OK? But in order, in order for us to do the antiderivative of x e to the negative x, what am I going to have to use to do that? Mm, which one? Integration by it's going to be integration by parts. So in order for me to take the antiderivative of this, I need to do integration by parts. So that's u and v prime. What's u going to be? 
So that means that e to the negative x. What's the derivative of x? Uh, x one half x squared. No, wait. Um, derivative. One. It's one. So it's going to be one dx. And then what is the antiderivative of e to the negative x? Negative e to the negative x. Very good. So applying my integration by parts, I still have the limit as v approaches infinity. But now I'm going to have it goes, oh God, it goes UB mm -hmm. minus B e prime DU. No, I think it's B e B e like regular. E. And then B prime. I think it's U and then B prime. Wait, what is yeah. the, oh, oh, because it's a real Yeah, that looks right. That looks right. All right. I think, yeah, actually, yeah, this is how it goes. This is how it goes. So now I'm going to have negative x e to the negative x to represent that u times b minus the integral that's still from a to b of v du. Now, one thing I do need to also include that I didn't leave a space for, so I'm going to have to erase this and rewrite that back end. Because I still got to evaluate this first part from a to b. So minus integral from a to b of negative e to negative x dx. So I need to evaluate this from a to b, this first part. So they would say the antiderivative of that, but I still got the integral of this over here. No parts for this integral. What's the antiderivative of negative e to the negative x? e to the negative x. So that's, I have a minus still, but this becomes e to the negative x, and that's going to get evaluated from a to b. So I've taken care of the integration part by applying integration by parts, and now I can apply my fundamental theorem of calculus. Yeah. Remember, fundamental theorem of calculus is when you plug in your top bound and you subtract it from when you plug in your lower bound. I still have this limit as b approaches infinity. Not going to make it. Top bound, that's negative b, e to the negative b, minus my lower bound. Since it's already a negative, that turns to a positive, a, e to the negative a. Minus what I get when I plug in my top bound to e to the negative x. That becomes e to the negative b minus e to the negative a. Be careful. I'm subtracting this entire uh, fundamental theorem of calculus evaluation. So make sure that you distribute that negative over. OK? Because this minus here, I'm subtracting what I get once I do that. Now we can apply the limit, but realize the limit is only going to apply to B. So the terms that don't have any B's in them, they got to get pulled off to the side. Okay? Because I can only evaluate the limit as B approaches infinity, not as B approach, like A approaches infinity. I don't have that there. So all of my terms that have an A, such as A, E to the negative A, and this positive E to the negative A, everybody see where I got the positive from, correct? Good. That's gonna uh, that's gonna be separate from when I actually evaluate the limit as b approaches infinity of negative b e to the negative b minus e to the negative b. Page extender time. Okay. Well, this next part, if you kind of want to watch it, then you can write down what you need to. All right. The first two terms I can leave alone because there's nothing else I can do with them, okay? I can't simplify them anymore. I mean, I could factor out e to negative a, but why? I'm not gonna change anything, okay? But over here, I do need to evaluate the limit as b approaches infinity. I'm gonna do something. 
and it's going to help it make sense. Okay. Since both of these terms have an e to a negative b in common, I am going to factor out over here. That's going to leave me with a negative b minus one. Is everybody still with me? And this is still at the limit as b approaches infinity. A negative exponent means what? It's under. Under. I want to write it that way. Um. With a positive exponent now. This makes it a lot easier to evaluate the limit. Mm -hmm. Now, when I evaluate the limit as b approaches infinity, I get infinity over infinity. Who remembers that when you get, yep, L'Hopital's, yes. I have to apply L'Hopital's rule because since I have a limit that gives me infinity over infinity, I can't have that. So L'Hopital's rule says I need to take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom and then try again. I tried. <laughs> like, I, mean, that's, I mean, that's pretty much how I look at it. It's like, it don't work, do it again. Okay, so. Still, the limit as b approaches infinity. What's the anti? Mm -mm. What's the derivative of the numerator? Negative what? One. Negative one. And what's the derivative of e to the b? Negative. Now, when I apply the limit as b approaches infinity, I don't get infinity over infinity anymore. Uh -oh. I get negative one over infinity. Is that another one? Which equals what? So this entire term is gone. So the, my final answer for the integral as a from a to infinity of x e to the negative x dx was that expression that we pulled out a few lines ago that was an effective. Oh my gosh. <laughs>